Today's episode is brought to you by Cattle. Every product launch faces a chicken and egg problem. You need reviews to convert, but you need conversions to get reviews. Cattle can help. Cattle helps brands win share. They leverage their consumer panel for insights, collecting receipts, and driving product ratings and reviews. It is the largest daily active survey panel in Canada, with over 10,000 daily active users and over 100,000 monthly active users. Let Cattle be your chicken and or your egg, depending on your perspective. Visit getcattle.com to learn more. When I was in university, my best friend had a heart attack from energy drinks. I had to rush him to the hospital. It's a happy ending of the story, he's okay. I was like, that always really bothered me. Why is there no healthy alternative? Welcome to Hearts and Carts, the CPG podcast, the podcast about the people behind the products that are winning hearts and filling carts. This cast is for anyone with an interest in the world of consumer products. We're your hosts, Justin Osborne and Alex Hill, and our mission is to bring you weekly content that helps you be a better and more informed CPG professional. All right, guys, get ready to bring the energy to another episode of Hearts and Carts. It's Alex, and I'm here with Justin, and we are going to be meeting with the founder of a company that helps people do just that. Justin, who are we chatting with today? We are meeting with Mitch Jacobson, who is the CEO and co-founder at Revita Energy Tea, which is the world's first energy tea in a low-carbon footprint pouch. It's the beverage for becoming the best you and elevating your energy. All right, everybody. If you haven't, please feel free to like, subscribe, follow us on our various social media and on the podcasting platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts or others. Reviews go a really long way for us and feedback as well. If you want to just shoot us feedback in our DMs at any point, we appreciate anything that helps us make this podcast better for you. And uh, with nothing else to add, We'll jump into our conversation with Mitch. Let's go. Mitch, how are you? I'm doing awesome. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Sorry about the last minute switch on the link there. I don't know what hey, was going no on. Worries. Zoom's yeah, giving me like, problems. Give you the Thank freshest you. link we had. I appreciate it. Yeah. How's how's life out in Calgary? Weather good? Life is good. Yeah. Where are you based, Justin? I'm on Vancouver Island. I'm in a town called Souk. I was just, and Alex is out in, in Hamilton. I was just saying my, my sister lives in Calgary, so I get out there pretty often and I'm missing it actually. I like to spend as much time as possible in Canmore. I think that might be like the most beautiful place on earth. Oh, isn't it incredible? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Souk's got to be up there too. I've been there a couple of times. Souk's nice, but the mountain, yeah. I, I mean, I love being near the ocean. I do love yeah. being near the ocean, but the mountains in, in Banff and Canmore just hit a little bit different. They really do, hey? Something special about it. Yeah, it's pretty, it's, oh, I can't take the cold anymore. I'm a big baby. So I don't <laughs> think I'll be moving back there, but... <laughs> But I, I love visiting whenever I can and just like spending as much time there as I can. So what um, brought it's you to nice. I was living in downtown Vancouver and I wanted more space. I wanted the yeah, I wanted the Al- more of the Alberta experience, having some more space, right? Like Fair enough. Uh, yeah. it was too expensive <laughs> living in the city and was in a maybe having a child had something to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah, wanted wanted to do yeah, maybe an extra bedroom for guests to visit, yeah. <laughs> you know, like a backyard. That, yeah. I, I think I told Alex this story before, but when I was in downtown vancouver i saw a, a dad playing catch with his son in a parking lot and i was like i don't want to do that like, like, I, <laughs> like, 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 like i want a backyard i want like you know, it's like I don't, you, know, you know so that was like a sign of like okay that you know we've, we've it's run its course here it's time to go yeah so time yeah. to have some more space well good for you man the island is so beautiful it is it's a uh, nice sunny day here can't complain at all i'm quite happy to be here right now that's for sure right on. I, would, I would take some sun right now yeah i don't know if the <laughs> looking but calgary's pretty nasty too yeah we've had a real bad cold snap here it's been like minus 30 for the last couple of weeks so right. we're just on the tail end of it hopefully yeah hopefully springs around the corner yeah, you gotta hope <laughs> well mitch how about i i give you a bit of an introduction and, and we'll jump into things what do you that think? sounds great alex thanks 
So we got Mitch Jacobson here, who's the co-founder and CEO of Revita Energy Tea. And and Mitch, what we like to do is we like to kind of just get to know our guests, kind of go through your background, how how you kind of came into your career and in your journey as an entrepreneur. And we'll ask a bunch of questions along the way. So maybe start by just taking us back to like school and, and, and kind of what you did from a school standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. So Mitch Jacobson, founder of Revite Energy T, and I've had a wild ride. I don't know how I ended up here because <laughs> I went to school for petroleum engineering. So <laughs> yeah. I grew up, I was that kid that loved Legos, loved building things. So ever since I was in grade school, I figured engineering was the path for me, right? Enjoyed math and science and all that. And so it was a pretty easy decision for me coming out of high school is I'm going into engineering and fourth generation oil and gas here in Canada. So oh, wow. Calgary, it just seemed like a natural fit. And they have an oil and gas engineering program at the University of Calgary. It doesn't even exist anymore. They couldn't get enough people to enroll in it. So they closed the program down. Wow. <laughs> a few years ago. So yeah, I spent, spent four years in university getting my degree and I came out and I got a really unique role in oil and gas that was kind of, I just come to, was just created basically when I graduated, which was a water sustainability engineer. So I was working in oil and gas, working on the sustainability side. So finding unique ways for oil companies to recycle more, water. you know, looking at the mm -hmm. carbon footprint of different technologies. So I actually got experience in, you know, sustainability that's carried over now to running a beverage company. So there's been a little bit of crossover there, but a pretty wild how I went from cool. oil and gas to energy tea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're still you're still in energy though. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Went from oil and gas to tea. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, I feel like I can't believe I got rid of that program. I feel like if you if you grew up in Calgary and even I mean like if you grew up anywhere in Canada, especially 10 years ago, like that was the industry you wanted to be in. Like, I remember being jealous of all my buddies that got jobs in that space because they were making so much money. It was like, I have picked the wrong career. What am, what am I doing here? <laughs> There's even days now where I'm looking back at my stock options and stuff. I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it was, it's a different. I realized I'm good I had it. Yeah, it's a very, yeah, very different world for sure. And so then, so you, you were doing that for, I think about about six years. You're kind of right, you know yeah. you know managing that, working through the engineer. I'm assuming liking it because that's a long time to spend at a place and and something that you knew you wanted to do from a young age. What what changed that you said you know I want to try something different? Yeah, well, a couple things. So I love the company that I was working at. Amazing company. You know I still keep in touch with a lot of the people there. But for me, I always had this dream deep down of being an entrepreneur, of wanting to work for myself and do my own thing. And the further I got into my career, I just felt that dream dying, right? Because the more financial commitments you take on, the more established you get in your career, you're just widening that gap, right? It's going to be that much harder to start. And so for me, I had an epiphany actually one day out in the field. I used to have to drive up to Northern Alberta in the middle of nowhere, Hinton Edson area. It's like three hours north of Edmonton. And I remember pulling over on the side of the road one day, looking at these two empty Red Bull cans. I was a energy drink addict at the time. And I thought a couple of things. I thought back to when I was in university, my best friend had a heart attack from energy drinks. I was looking at him, had to rush him to the hospital. It's a happy ending of the story. He's okay. I was like, that always really bothered me. Why is there no healthy alternatives, right? And then here yeah. I am, like six years later, corruption energy drinks like their water. And then two, I was like... I just had this moment where I'm looking at myself in the rear view mirror and I'm like, I love my job, but this isn't what I wanted for my life, right? I wanted to be doing my own thing. I wanted to be, you know, a person that was creating something really cool and creating opportunities for others. And I'm like, this, I got to make a change. Like either I'm going to let this dream die and I'm just going to keep doing my oil and gas thing, or I'm going to, you know, pursue this business. And I thought of that, you know, my friend that had a heart attack, I'm like healthy energy drink, something I've always wanted. I've never been able to find one. Why don't I just start? creating one. Had no idea where to start. It started with a Google search on the side of that dirt road, middle of nowhere. But yeah, you know, almost five years later from that moment, here we are today, we're carried in about a thousand stores across Canada. I got listed in Walmart, have our own manufacturing facility here in Calgary. So it's pretty crazy what can come out of just making the decision to start. Hey guys, sorry to throw off our flow here, but we got a sponsor. No, I know you're thinking, oh, they got money. No, we didn't get money. We got emotional support. So, Justin, tell them. So even though we want you guys to listen to Hearts and Cards exclusively with all of your free time, if you're going to listen to another podcast, make sure to check out our friends, Phil and Kenny, and their podcast, This Commerce Life. 
talks about the CPG world, has some amazing guests, and you can learn a lot. Well, guys, we'll let you get back to the show, but you got to check out this commerce life. Those guys are the best. So you started with some Google searching and then like, and then what, like, what was, what was step, step one when you got back from the field? Did you like sit down and I'm going to make a business plan. I'm, I'm in. Did you start making some calls? Like what was, what was kind of your, your, your jumping off point? Yeah, more or less. So, you know, I had this idea for, it wasn't even a healthy energy drink. Actually, initially it was like going to be a healthy alcoholic beverage that would kind of replace like red bull when you're out you know at the mm-hmm. bar and stuff yeah. and that just ended up leading to a non-alcoholic energy drink but my the first step was a google search then yep. i ordered this book on amazon that was about starting a beverage company and then just took things mm-hmm. from there so then i started messing around in my kitchen with like things i would buy at safeway right i'm like mixing coffee powder together <laughs> in tea bags and stuff <laughs> figured out pretty quick i had no idea what i was doing but this book i was reading simultaneously talked about food scientists i didn't even know this was a profession but you yeah know, there's people that are completely devoted to just helping entrepreneurs like me develop a food product so started making cold calls happened to find one that was willing to help me out I had a big retainer that I, I needed to try and figure out how to pay for because I still had student loans and whatnot. So don't tell my bank, but I took my student <laughs> line of credit and maxed it out and used that <laughs> as capital and started working with this food scientist. So over the course of it ended up taking two years. I thought it was going to take three or four months, but we just went back and forth and back and forth, a whole bunch of different samples. And just after hundreds of iterations, we ended up landing on the formula that we have today. Very cool. And, what, and how did you like in that process? Like, I'm assuming taste was a high priority. Like, what were some of your priorities that you were trying to to achieve with the with your 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 scientist? Yeah, great question. So initially, it was I was kind of just going straight for function. I didn't I wanted it to taste good, of course, but I didn't worry about that coming out of the gate. So I gave this food scientist a list of all the ingredients we were going to use. I had like vegan branch chain amino acids and stuff, like some pretty obscure things. And I'll never forget, it was like $15,000 to get to this point. I get these samples and I have all my friends and family over. So everybody that I care about comes over and I get those red party cups and I I label them A through E, put them on the table and we're going to do blind taste testing, right? Because someone had told me along the way, make sure you do blind taste tests and make sure your stuff tastes good. So I've made everyone fill out sheets and I'm collecting the sheets at the end of this and sample A tastes great. Sample B seems familiar. We'd buy this again. I get to sample D. It's like tastes terrible wouldn't buy this again. Rob, my business partner puts, tastes like battery acid. I'm like, what is sample D? Look at my sheet. Sample D was my drink. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so, humiliating myself with everybody that I knew, right? I'm like, dude, well in oil and gas. Like, what are you doing? This drink tastes like battery acid. Like, don't even think about quitting your job. So I learned really quick that it's really difficult to balance function and taste. So we had to, you know, completely rework the original formula. We got rid of the vegan branch chain amino acids. That's when we started working with organic honey. Then we added in the tea. Then we started working with some juices. And, you know, we went from dead last in the blind taste test to like third last. And then we were, you know, by the end, we were winning that blind taste test, you know, consistently. So that was the, the process. It definitely uh, did not start out super awesome. Yeah. yeah. The blind taste testing is smart, I think, right? Because yeah, you know, if you have everyone you care about over, they're probably going to say, oh yeah, this is yeah. great. <laughs> and maybe it does suck, right? And you and you need to know that because you don't want to, what are you going to spend the next year of your life trying to sell something that's terrible? So I think that's a smart way to do it. Yeah. yeah and you yeah. see the improvement over time as well, right? As you, you track see the improvement over time. And it's pretty funny looking back at those sheets because even like we went through, you know, 15 different company names and every sheet would have a different name for the product and stuff. So it's, yeah, I think if you're going to start a food or, or beverage product, like do blind taste tests because your family will lie to you. They will right? yeah. <laughs> They'll try to find yeah. whatever's good about it. And the market does not lie because once you put it out there, like you'll hear real quick whether it's good or not. Yeah. So I always like demos when you see someone, a complete stranger, try it. They might say, oh, that tastes all right. But you can tell by their face, like they hated that. They hated <laughs> <it>. <laughs> oh, yeah. Demos are a whole different animal. Yeah. I'm to tell, but I like the blind taste testing. Let's maybe we should take a step back here. So for anyone listening that hasn't seen the product before, what is it? Like explain it to somebody that's never tried the product, tasted the product. You know, what? what is it? Yeah, simply put, Revita Energy Tea is a healthy energy drink. So we use all natural ingredients and we call it an energy tea because the caffeine comes from tea. And 
you know, really high level. The reason we chose tea is tea naturally contains amino acids that combine with the caffeine. So you don't get the same crash that you would have prolonged the positive effects on the caffeine. Mm -hmm. And then we've, you know, you probably noticed we use this, you know, really unique, cool, flexible beverage pouch brings the yeah. back nostalgic vibes of a Capri Sun, right? Yeah. So we, we made it adult friendly. So we can get into why we, we use the flexible beverage pouch, but the long and short of it was because I had that background in sustainability. When I looked at the data, I just couldn't believe why more companies weren't using it. It had the lowest carbon footprint and of everything, anything I was able to find. It took up less space and transportation, the water usage and the greenhouse gas emissions and manufacturing was the best that I was able to find. So it was a combination of wanting to differentiate ourselves as a brand, but also the environmental loss ended up landing on the pouch. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because it's, yeah, the sustainability angle. I mean, I, of course, I didn't know all of those things, the sustainability angle side, but I even just like the way that it looks because it is so different. Like with everything you're competing, everything else is a can or a bottle, right? Right. Yeah. How do you really stand out? Because that was, you know, when I started talking to people about this and guys in industry, I'm like, hey, I'm going to start a healthy energy drink. They laughed at me. They're like, what do you, how are you going to compete? with these billion dollar companies, right? Yeah. Like the big boys sell billions of cans a year of their drinks. Like, how are you going to differentiate yourself? And so we thought, why don't we do something just completely different? So when you're walking down that energy drink aisle, it's all cans, right? Maybe the odd bottle yeah. and now you have a pouch. Like that's going to stand out. It's going to immediately tell a consumer subconsciously that we're different in some way. And it's uh, it's been probably our greatest asset as a new brand. Very cool. Is that something that you were you were worried about going into it? Because you're right, there's there's red bull which is huge and then the other big guys are owned by coke and pepsi so you're going against like giants in the industry that have enormous sales team and feed in the street and all that so it's it's a, a tough category to compete in and obviously you've done quite well but on the outside looking in i would imagine that was a bit daunting oh super daunting i think my naivety was probably my greatest asset because i really didn't <laughs> think too much about it <laughs> yeah. truthfully if i knew then what i know now i probably never would have started it <laughs> i was just you know, I was young and excited and I was like, who cares if Red Bull's huge? Like, we'll just go to stores and get it in there and, and push the product. And yeah, it's it's a brutally competitive space. But the fact that we're differentiated, the fact that we're healthy too, we're not really we're not going after the same consumer mm -hmm. as the typical energy drink brand. So in a way, yes, they're competitive, but we're not really competing because mm -hmm. you know, our core consumer is you know, 25 to 45, we're actually a female dominated brand, which is really unique for energy drinks. Hmm. It's like professionals that, you know, we hear all the time, I would never drink an energy drink, but I'll drink your guys' stuff. Right. And so yeah. I think in a lot of ways we're yes, we're competing with them, but we're also going after completely different. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. It makes, it makes sense. Right. It is a completely different product. When I think of energy drinks, I definitely do not think healthy. Right. I think, I think the exact opposite. So it is a completely differentiated product. And that's so interesting because I also think energy drinks is a lot more male skewed and dominated. So it's interesting to hear that you're more female skewed. Yeah, we're a female skewed brand. And we actually did that intentionally because I uh, <laughs> didn't have any business background. But the little bit of research that I did is I, I noticed something fascinating when you looked at the consumer demographics of like, say, just a regular monster or a regular Red Bull, like full sugar, right? 40, 50 grams of sugar, whatever it is. It was the, exactly who you would expect, right? 18 to 25, you know, not college educated, typically like the typical guy you imagine drinking a monster, since, right? Which I love, yeah. brands, by the way, too. I think they're, they've done incredible things. But then when you looked at their sugar-free version, the demographics was totally different. Now it was like 25 to 40, college educated, mm. higher income. So I was like, hey, I think there's a problem here, right? There's this professional person who's looking for a healthy energy drink, there's nothing out there. So they're just drinking the sugar-free versions, which when you start looking at, you know, artificial sweeteners and stuff, like we weren't willing to compromise on that because my personal belief is they're not good for you, even though I respect companies that use them. So mm -hmm. we seen, we felt like there was a problem there and especially with the female consumer because all of these brands, right? Like you look at their advertising, it's geared towards men for the most part, right? And when we you know, kind of interviewed some, you know, some of our good friends, the woman that we know in our lives, like they said a few things, I don't resonate with the brand. And two, I can't reseal a can once I open it, I don't want to drink it in one shot. So that was two yeah. of the big yeah. things that we, you know, incorporated into our brand too, is let's make a very professional brand that's neutral that, you know, any professional would feel proud to walk around with. But two, you know, the fact that we can make it resealable makes it that much more appealing to demographics that don't want to drink a 473 milliliter you know, energy drink in one go, right? Yeah. How much, how much caffeine 
an average average uh revita 140 milligrams so about a medium <laughs> cup of coffee yeah and it's actually you know most energy like there's a caffeine cap actually in canada there's not in the u.s so you have energy drinks down there that are like 300 400 milligrams but here the caffeine cap i think is about 116 for a 473 so we're right in line but all of our caffeine comes from from tea and guarana seeds so it all comes from natural source gotcha so guarana guarana has caffeine in it itself i didn't realize that yeah, I was never, I was never really clear. Like I know it Guarana's in like, some energy drinks. I think yeah. Red Bull, but I didn't realize it was caffeinated itself. Yeah, it doesn't contain a lot of caffeine actually. Like it's it's not very much. Like of the 140 milligrams, I think it only contributes five or ten of those milligrams in our drinks. But it Got has it. a lot of antioxidants. It's a really amazing seed from Brazil. When you look up some of the health benefits of it, so that was one of the reasons that we chose to add a little bit of Guarana seed in addition to the tea that we use. Very cool. So you, you've you made the product, uh, I'm assuming, how, how long did it take you to go from like idea to walk into your first store and saying, can I put this on your shelf? Yeah, so I thought it was going to take like six months, of course, naively. It took well <laughs> over two years. So we started yeah. in like right at the end of 2017 and we didn't launch until October of 2019. So God. it was a, a two-year process of like developing the, the brand, getting the Health Canada approvals, that was a long process. And then everything that... I just took for granted how long things were going to take, right? Everything from getting yeah. this insurance, getting your logo and everything designed. It's a lengthy, it's a lengthy process, especially when you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. And you want to do it all right too, right? And you guys have done a beautiful job on your brand and your packaging and, and your product. So it's, I think it paid off, right? Like it's the type of thing where if you've done it in six months, we probably, we probably might not be talking about <laughs> it right now. So yeah. well, we still made a lot of mistakes. So our first, uh, you know, minimum orders is a big thing in, in CPG, right? Like the minimum mm -hmm. orders for stuff is massive. So our minimum order on packaging initially was 11,000, which to me felt like might as well have been 11 million. So we order those 11,000 pouches. We get a third party to, to fill them for us. And I'll, I'll walk into my very first store and the manager likes it. He tries the product. He likes it. He goes to scan the barcode on the bottom. The barcode doesn't scan. I use the wrong format barcode. Oh, on no. 11,000 pouches. But then it gets worse. Then he starts giggling to himself. I'm like, what are you, is there something funny? He's like, is this a, is this an inside joke? He's looking at the back. So we have to put a warning on there that says, it's a health Canada thing, not for person sensitive to caffeine. any caffeinated drink has to put that on there. Well, I spelled sensitive, S-E-N-S-T-I-T-V-E. -E. So I put tit on the back <laughs> of 11,000 packages. <laughs> but I swear, we proofread like the hundreds of packages. Oh. So, so thank you for the compliment, Alex. We've come a long way, but it certainly didn't start. <laughs> it didn't start out so smooth. Yeah, yeah. that's C CPG props. Those are two <laughs> big ones that, that I, I have heard many people talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Check your barcode and make sure you spell check everything. I don't know how we <laughs> missed that one, but it's made for a funny story, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those that sometimes you, like you said, you look at it a thousand times, but you're only seeing what you want to see at that point. You need somebody else to look at it because you, you're just so lost in the weeds of the packaging that you're not oh, even actually. like like a word that you know how to spell. Right? Yeah, like, like yeah, you know what it's spell, like, just can't. <laughs> your brain just fills. Your brain just fills it in. Like, yeah. You just, yeah. You just you just read what you think it should say. Yeah. Exactly. Lessons learned. We learned a lot of a lot of hard lessons early on. Yeah. I'm curious about about your team. So you you have yourself, Carly, and Rob, and yeah. it looks like looks like you stayed in your job until 2020. So there was a jumping off point. And I want to ask a bit about what you know what gave you that you know the the certainty that you were you were all in and you were going to leave oil and gas as well but tell, tell us about your team and, and how you guys kind of divide and conquer yeah so the three co-founders so it's my sister carly so she's a former cardiac nurse yeah quit her job kind of early 2020 as well to pursue this full time and then cool. my best friend basically brother rob who was a geophysicist in oil and gas and quit his job in late 2019. So we all come from completely unrelated backgrounds, but have somehow managed to kind of pull things together between the three of us and, and figure this crazy world of CPG out. Very cool. Very cool. And 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 those two, like the three of you have been kind of on this journey for the two years of R&D and all that. Yeah, that's right. So I had that moment on the side of the road that I told yeah. you guys about and got back to the city and, and went to Carly and Rob. I'm like, hey, guys, I got this crazy idea. Like, what do you think? They're like, yeah, absolutely, we're in. And we just took it from there. So they were there, yeah. with, you know, all the samples with the food scientists and helping develop the brand and coming up with the name. And 
yeah, it's been, we have a really great relationship. I mean, we've certainly had our moments like any group of founders, <laughs> but I got to say it works really well because we all have very differing strengths. So Rob is, he, he was a professional photographer, beautiful eye for design and marketing. So he sort of manages that piece of our business. Harley being a nurse is really good with people. So she's managing mm -hmm. her sales, like in-store customer service, order fulfillment, that type of stuff. And then my background as an engineer, now that we have our own production line in Calgary, you know, it's the operation side and actually running the, the manufacturing and operation side of the business. So we've, uh, I think that makes a great partnership when you have people that have very different strengths. Totally. Totally. That's cool. That's, that's awesome that you have like a family member in there and yeah, old, like it sounds like the kind of the perfect, the perfect situation to have good friends and family all together in a business. And, and what was the watermark you guys hit that when you were like, you know what, let's quit our jobs and let's, let's do this all in. Yeah. So we launched, we kind of like a soft launch in October, 2019, where like, I got a pallet delivered to my house, right. From a third party manufacturer. And we're like slaying cases out of my living room. And this is where I'm really going back and forth. Like, should I quit my job? Right. Cause at the time I'm just like slinging cases on the weekend and evenings and stuff. And I have, you know, my father's, you know, an amazing entrepreneur. I really look up to, and I'll never forget. I went out for dinner with him one night and he's like, you need to quit your job. Like, like either do this or quit. Like you can't do both. It's not fair to your employer for one, but two, like if you even want a hope of this ever becoming something, like you have to be all in. And so that was, yeah, like kind of Christmas time of 2019. And I came back and first week back in the office, I went into my, my boss's office, shut the door and explained to him what I was doing, gave, you know, a month of notice and, and that was the end of it. So I think, you know, my personal opinion is, you know, I had some money saved and stuff. So I had at least a year that I was going to be able to survive financially without taking a paycheck. So when I talked to other young entrepreneurs, like one, yeah. you, should quit. you have to be financially responsible, right? And I, at that point, had a couple of good years in oil and gas. So I had some money saved. And, but I do think, you know, if you're going to do this entrepreneurship thing, like I'm giving her seven days a week, full throttle, and we're barely getting by most of the time. So I think it's naive to think that you can do this part time, especially in CPG for the long term and expect to compete with the big boys, right? Because you're already at such a disadvantage. So long winded answer to your question, but it was no, a great conversation with my dad that, you know, really made me realize like, hey, if I'm going to do this, you know, and the question I like to ask, ask myself when I'm making a big decision is, at the end of my life, right, when I'm on my deathbed, am I going to look back and regret not doing this? Or am mm -hmm. I we're going to regret you know, playing it safe. Right. And yeah. I thought I'll never, even if this fails, you know, I'll, I don't think I'll ever regret taking a shot. Right. And the courage that it took. And at least I know that I don't have to ask myself what if, but yeah. if I keep playing it safe and just doing this part-time, it's probably going to go nowhere. And I know for a fact, I'll always look back and regret them. That was the decision making process. Yeah, yeah. I think you, that is what happens, right? I think a lot of entrepreneurs try and do both. And then they, I've said this quote before, Alex, you've heard this before, but Ron Swanson on Parks and Rec, right? shouldn't half-ass two things you should whole-ass one thing so you have to decide <laughs> what you want to do and, and focus on that and i think that's there, there always is that sort of tipping point where you have to move on and and do if you're really going to go for this you've got to actually go for it and it's always a differing place for people um, i wanted to ask you about manufacturing because you talked about how you were naive on maybe some of the sales side stuff but i would imagine on the manufacturing side an engineering background would be fantastic right and, and you talked a little bit about the very beginning, it sounds like you're using a co-packer. You now have your own manufacturing. So maybe talk about like the the decision to do your own manufacturing versus third party, and why you did that, what that looked like, how long it took. So window into that. Yeah, absolutely. So we started the business like most consumer products using a third party manufacturer. So we were using co-packer. And I figured out pretty quick that there's a lot of pros and cons to using a, a co-packer. I mean, the pros being you don't got to put up a million bucks to build your own line, right? You should be getting some expertise from them. But the cons being, you know, in a lot of ways, you don't control your own business, right? Like we're getting purchase orders and then going to our manufacturing partners and they can't fill it that month. So like when you slave away and hustle and grind to get a big PO and then you can't fill it, like that was the most disheartening thing for me. And looking at the business long term, I'm like, do I really want to be beholden to a third party, right? And there's some really good ones out there. I know some some amazing CPG brands that have a great relationships. And if you're one of those brands, you're you you know, I'm really happy for you. I think that's probably the exception to the rule. 
And so we got into the situation where there's really not any companies in Canada that can fill these pouches at a, at a full scale. It's just such unique filling equipment that you need. And we came to a crossroads where it was like, if we want to scale, continue to scale this business and grow it into the multi-millions in revenue, there's no one else in Canada that can help us. So we either need to build our own manufacturing line or we got to call it quit. It was kind of that same crossroads that I had when I was going to quit my job. And so the stars sort of aligned at that same time, the lease next to us, because we had a warehouse lease that we were just using for distribution, it came up. So we were able to grab that lease. And again, it was back to like square one on the side of the dirt road. I Googled, how do you build a manufacturing line? Started making calls, you know, found a filling machine overseas because it's very specialized equipment and just sort of started piecing things together. So it's been the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. It was far harder than actually developing the beverage, like just the amount of moving parts, the amount of capital, the amount of, you know, shutdowns and things breaking and, you know, all equipment from all different suppliers having to come together and, and fit together and work. It's been, uh, been a huge challenge, but it's something I'm super proud of because now we have the only manufacturing line of its kind in Canada. Wow. And, and do you guys staff the line too? Like, I'm assuming that even would be a learning curve. Yeah, we staffed the line. So we're doing it all ourselves right now. Like just before this podcast, I was back there in rubber boots and air nets and cleaning our filling machine, getting it ready to go for tomorrow. So yeah, we have, you know, a couple of part-time employees that come in and help run the line. Full-time warehouse manager that helps manage it. And awesome. the interim here until we hire a production on filling on that role. So it's been a pretty, you know, wild experience going from, you know, basically a sales and marketing company. Because when you have a co-packer, that's where you are really, right? Someone else makes yeah. you your drink and then you're just you know doing the marketing and sales to now being that on top of also being a manufacturing company it's very interesting right i think to your point a lot of people start with a co-packer because of cost or because of expertise or because they just don't even know where to get started but inevitably you get to a certain point where you're having trouble with your co-packer and then wish that you had your own manufacturing <laughs> so i think the, the earlier you can do it it can set you up for success and gives you the ability to scale usually a lot quicker. So I think there's a lot of positives with it. We've had people like Mike Fata on the show that talked a lot about like he likes investing in companies that own their own manufacturing. Like yeah. that's one of his things that he looks at. So it is something that that a lot of people are looking at when they're they're evaluating investments and in potential companies. Absolutely. And I, I agree completely with Mike because you know like I know, you know, a lot of my friends in CPG, like there's a lot of horror stories out there about co-packers, right? And how do you grow your business when you know a co-packer can effectively own you? So, you know, we're still going to use a co-packer, especially when we expand to the U.S., but just the fact that we can make our own product gives us control of our own business, right? I'm never going to be beholden to a third party. And that's, you know, I got into entrepreneurship because I wanted to, you know, work for myself and do my own thing and be creative. And, you know, when you're, if you're too reliant on one, whether it be a manufacturing company or an ingredient supplier or anyone, they're kind of your boss in a lot of ways, right? They put yeah. in a price increase or they tell you, hey, you got bumped for a bigger company. You're not getting any product this month. What do you do? Yeah, it's yeah. Nothing is the short answer, which is why yeah, it no, sucks. No, <laughs> which is why it sucks. But yeah, you're yeah, you're you're absolutely right. It, the challenge. Uh, so you touched on U.S. there a little bit. So I know you said you're in a thousand stores in Canada. You mentioned Walmart. I want to give a shout out to any other retailers in Canada, and then let's talk about like international expansion plans outside of Canada. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, we're carrying about a thousand accounts across Canada. So Walmart, Safeway, Sobeys, Co-op, you know, being some of our bigger accounts. We're also in all the Whole Foods in the West here. So we're like, we're in the Whole Foods in Victoria there. We're in, you know, Nature's Emporium, out East, like a whole bunch of the health food chains. So like Blush Lane, a lot of those independents. So really grateful for all our retail partners. And one thing that's great about Canada is, you know, some of these local programs, just a huge asset. You know, like the Sobeys local program in Alberta here was really how we got our start. Same with, uh, Cal you know, Calgary Co-op brought us on when we were, you know, just like two months in business, they gave us a shot. So yeah. that is one of the, you know, the beautiful things about, about Canada is there's a lot of really great local programs that, you know, have helped us get to where we are today. Yeah, yeah, local programs are cool. I didn't when I was working in traditional CPG, I didn't even know that they existed. But it's it's a great way to get your product into like a major national retailer, which which is like you know is sort of impossible to get a national listing right away. It lets you test out those national retailers and add individual stores, and then prove yourself and build a story to get that national scale. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool, yeah. And usually they don't come with listing fees, or if they do. It's something very manageable. So for like a young brand like us, you know, we were able to sell into our local Calgary Safeways and build the brand up from there. So we collected so much data, 
like got to meet the store managers, got to understand what kind of merchandising work, what kind of merchandising didn't work, you know, really figure things out from the grassroots. And, and that's really how we got our start as a brand. And I just have so much gratitude for, you know, like guys like Gary Hughes, who runs the local program for Sobeys here in Alberta has been a huge support, same with Calgary Block and, you know, the Keith Rosada and BC too, uh, you know, it got us into the local program out there. So we're in the thrifty food stores on the island, thanks to him. So yeah, it's, you know, to your point, it's, it's a huge advantage for young brands. And I think it's, it's really important. And then international, let's talk international a little yeah, bit. International's yeah, international Working on the U.S. right now. So, yeah, making a flight out there. It looks like May. So looking at some third-party manufacturing options in the U.S. So just, you know, it makes sense if we could have someone make it for us in the U.S. And then we can take care of our Canadian operations from our facility here in Calgary. And then we're just going to start feeling out brokers and distributors. And I'm hoping by 2024, we'll be able to have a presence, probably start in like Seattle area, Seattle, Washington, like the Pacific Northwest. Good, yeah, 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 close by, good, good market. By, yeah, exactly. You know, the beautiful thing about, you know, the U.S. is they're more of a tea drinking nation than Canada. They drink like something like two times the amount of energy drinks per person on average <laughs> or something like that. Like it's quite a bit more energy drink consumption down there. So I think we'll we'll definitely fit a, fit a niche down there and hopefully see some great traction when we get started. Awesome. Exciting. Exciting. I noticed, and I don't think it's out yet, but you guys recorded with Dragon's Den or... Yeah, I don't, I don't know what you could share. So yeah, for sure. So we auditioned. So the producers came to Calgary. So I think they come to Calgary, Vancouver, and Toronto. So we we submitted an application. They accepted us for coming to audition to the producers. So it's it's pretty cool how they do it. It's kind of like it's really like the den. Like you go in there, they call you up. You're in front of the producers. They ask questions just like they would on the den. So we went through our whole pitch just like we would on the show. It went extremely well. We got really great feedback. So we're supposed to know by the end of the month here. And then if they accept us, then we fly to Toronto to actually be on. Very so, cool. Really exciting opportunity. Like, I don't think we've ever really been ready for the den, but now we're at a point in our business where we could really use the investment dollars. And then two, we have, you know, the revenue and the manufacturing and sort of the base built where I think hopefully will be a, a very appealing investment for a few of the dragons. Love it. Love it. It's exciting. Thanks. I've never heard of the the... The initial pitch, I guess the pitch before the pitch, but it makes a lot of sense. That's kind of a, a cool yeah. even background there. I didn't know how that's how it worked either. But yeah, it's kind of the pitch before the pitch to see if you're going to be entertaining yeah. for TV. And yeah, yes. I don't know. We got enough crazy stories and hopefully we will be. And yeah. yeah. You guys are at a good size, good product, good branding, great story. I think, yeah, you, you're a perfect fit for that show from that perspective. Thanks so much. Yeah, we're gonna try and make it as entertaining as we can and should be great exposure. And and we're, you know, hoping to raise some money here anyway. So the timing really couldn't be better. Yeah. That, that's that's what I was gonna ask you about actually, is the it's sort of like the what's next for the company here. I know probably raising money, continue to expand, going into the US, you talked about anything, anything else? Yeah, so we're you know, we've really built a great base now. So we've been uh there's been a ceiling with our supply the last three years. Like we just, we, we had more demand than we had supply because we just didn't have our manufacturing figured out. So now that our manufacturing line is fully completed now, really as of January, we got our new filling machine in there. It's the first one in Canada. We have the supply to, you know, scale to about 10 times the size that we are now. So the future plans the next few years is all going to be based around growth. So we're doing a capital raise right now with that, that capital is going to be used for listing fees, you know, staffing, everything that we're going to need to take our business to the next level. And I keep pushing more marketing, expanding into more stores across Canada, and then start dipping our toes into the U.S. market. Very cool. That's exciting. I love yeah. to see Canadian brands expand to the U.S. and, and hopefully take over, right? So it's great. really cool to see, right? There's been so many amazing Canadian brands, you know, that are really making headwaves in, in CPG, right? You know, you look at some of the top talked about brands right now are Canadian companies. so. We hope to, uh, we want to be in that conversation too. We had a lot of work to do, but we're going to get there. Revita has entered the chat. <laughs> but yeah, that's where we want like to be. It. Yeah, we got a lot of work to do though. So one one thing we're always interested in for our, our guests, Mitch, is how they kind of optimize, manage their time, how they, you know, I don't know if you have, some people are super methodical. Some people are kind of by the seat of their pants, but just curious what your kind of recipe is to, to get the most out of your days and weeks in terms of time management and prioritization? Yeah, great, great question, Alex. Maybe you guys can give me some tips because I'm still figuring <laughs> out that. But it's, I've been sort of all over the place. 
But one thing I always come back to, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with Andy Frisella, who's, uh, you know, got the, the MF CEO podcast. I was yeah. a big fan of that when it was yep. out. And we always talked about the power list, right? Doing three to five things a day that really move the needle forward. And so that's really been my approach because as an entrepreneur, you're pulled in a thousand different directions a day. It's really easy to get caught up in the minutia. But yeah. I make a list in the morning of like three things that if I get those three things done that day, it's going to move the needle, right? And they might yeah. be tasks that take two minutes. It might be, you know, a call to a supplier, it might be an email I send to a buyer, and it might be, you know, going over and checking in with one of my staff. But that's really been my my strategy is I call it the brick a day strategy. I think uh, Will Smith maybe originally came up with it, but like, how do you build a great wall one brick at a time, right? And like yeah. every day I look at it as an opportunity to lay one brick. So as long as I'm doing one thing that progresses the business, you know, forward every day, I feel like we're going to make progress because, you know, that's how we came up with the brand, right? I was so overwhelmed on the side of that dirt road, no idea where to start. Like, how do you start a beverage company, right? What's step one? Well, you know, the first brick laid was that Google search and then I just went from there. So that's really been my, I guess, productivity strategies. <laughs> it's probably not as complex or as, as, you know, well thought out as probably a lot of the other entrepreneurs you've had on there, but that's in the way that we just progress and things forward. I love it. I, I think it's, you know, sometimes, you know, complicated can be, you know, great and, and often complicated. It's impressive just because it is complicated, but simple is really powerful, right? Like, yeah. and, and and it's not just what we do, it's what we choose not to do that usually defines how effective we're being. And, you know, getting down to three things in a day and then really finding those priorities that move the needle, I think, is an exercise in in clearing out all that noise, right? Of other things you might do, and and just finding those you know best three things. So I I love it. I think it's simple. I mean, I have a whatever a five minute journal here in the room, and I mean that's basically what that tries to get you to do too, right? It's it's a similar similar methodology. So yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, you know, I would agree, right? Usually, it's that you know, there's only one or two things you do a day that probably really push the business forward. That's what I've learned anyways. And most of the time, those one or two things are the things you don't want to do, right? It's like that 100%. difficult conversation with an employee that you've been putting off, or it's like that sales call you've just been dreading to make. And so I've, you know, I've really noticed that if I force myself to just do those couple of really hard things that I've been putting off, that's Probably. where, you know, 90% of your results are going to come from. That is not something they teach you. Like, I, I know you did engineering, but that is not something they teach you at business school. <laughs> <laughs> they've never, they've never, yeah, don't, there's, <laughs> there's never a, a point where your teacher's like, you're probably only going to get one or two really important things done in a day. Exactly. Right. And the rest is, you know, <laughs> barely going to move the needle forward. Right? Just, yeah. I can figure that out over time. Yeah. It's all just meetings and firefighting <laughs> and getting pulled in a million directions and doing this and that. And so I like, I think the the brick analogy is good. I think that makes a lot of sense, right? Just make sure that you're constantly moving the business forward. If you're doing that, and you look back on the year, you'll have done a lot of good stuff. Yeah, you'll have made some progress, even if it's not where you want to be. And I mean, I have my share of really bad days here where it feels like everything goes wrong. But if I can look myself in the mirror at the end of the day and be like, hey, you know, I laid a brick today, like everything else sucked. But <laughs> we made a little bit of progress. So I guess we're, you know, somewhat moving in the right direction. I think it's a good way to keep your sanity to over time too. Yeah, absolutely. Another question that we ask all of our guests is what we call brand fan. So what is a product or brand that is out there in the market that you absolutely love? Yeah, great. I think Liquid Death is one of the first ones that comes to yeah. mind, man. That's got to be one of, if not the greatest <laughs> marketed products ever, right? Like it's just... We've learned so much from watching their marketing strategy. The fact that they can create a billion dollar brand selling water in a can, is just unbelievable to me. And right. I think it just speaks to the power of connecting with your consumers. You know, they're very polarizing too, right? There's just, there's a lot of people that hate the brand, but there's more people that love it clearly. And I think uh, there's a lot to be learned from, from what they're doing. Yeah. It's one that, uh, Alex and I are smiling because a few people have said that one. And it is, I think, because a lot of people love it. And then even the people that hate it, they're still talking about it. They're still talking about it. And so it creates like this, like it's actually creating a reaction in people. Most brands just play the middle road and they don't want to upset anyone. But by doing so, they're not disrupting. They've like done it in such a way that you have like an actual huge reaction to their product. <laughs> exactly, right? You either love it or you hate it. But you're right. Even if you hate it, you're telling everybody about yeah. how much you hate it. It's a very interesting and like 
that's literally water in a can. And they've created this this monstrous brand that everyone's talking about. And I told Alex this at, at the CHFA trade shows, it's like every other person is walking around with one. It's like it's, it's it's madness. So yeah, they're they're a, a master class in in branding and marketing for sure. They truly are. Like they're one of the greatest marketed companies, I think, maybe ever. So there's a lot to be learned from the approach they've taken. And yeah, just really, really cool case study. Okay, Mitch, last question for you. Putting yourself back. Let's let's say, you know, in the shoes of a, of a early 20 something, someone who's um, maybe thinking about a career in consumer products, maybe starting their own thing. If you're going to give them one or two pieces of advice from your soapbox, what are you telling this this young individual? Yeah, my biggest piece of advice would be start today. Like get off this podcast and go do a Google search. How do I start this company, <laughs> right? Stop making the I call it the someday excuse because I was famous for that, right? Someday when I'm out of school, I'll start. Someday when I have more money, I'll start. Someday when I'm more established in my career. Someday when I have this. Someday when I have that. Well, some days, you know, it's never a day in the calendar, right? It's never going to come. You're going to keep making that excuse. But if there's one thing that I could go back and tell myself, you know, in my early 20s, would just be to like start. And that starting point can just be laying that one brick a day, right? You can start with a Google search. How do I do this? Then buy a book on it, you know, then start a business plan and start screwing around in your kitchen like me. That'd be my biggest piece of advice. I think it's so easy to make a ton of excuses why you can't get started or why you can't do something, but take action because that's the only way you're going to make progress. And I had no idea in the world how to start a garbage company. And, you know, five years later from that moment on the side of the road, here we are with our own manufacturing line with our product in Walmart. So it's pretty crazy what can happen when you just get started and keep laying those bricks. One brick at a time. Love one it. One brick at a time. That's right. Yeah. And the, the first one's the hardest. We've had other entrepreneurs <laughs> say that too, right? Is I think people get stuck in like, I mean, I've been guilty of this when I've had what I thought was a good idea. Maybe it wasn't, but yeah. I'm like, no, maybe one day I'll look at that. I think we all do that. So it, it's, it's, it's fantastic advice for anyone out there that's been waiting on something and wanting to do it to just, just start. Yeah. Just get going. Like, I think, you know, even I have to use this, you know, frequently, right. We want to make a new flavor. It's like overwhelming. And I'm like, Hey, I just go in the lab and start to mix this stuff together. Right. But like, yeah. that's usually how the best ideas come. Same with our manufacturing line. Like that was a hugely overwhelming task, but you know, I Googled, a, you know, a guy in Calgary cold called him. Like he said he could help me and just everything took off from there. So Like you said, that first one's the hardest one to lay, but once you lay the first brick down, it's amazing how much momentum you can build by just keeping at it. It's awesome. I love that. A lot of great advice in there for for anyone starting out kind of throughout this episode. Will you be at CHFA West at the end of the month? Absolutely, I will be. Yeah. So I think we're in the booth 2200 something. Yeah, I'll be making a LinkedIn post about it. But yeah, I'll be sure to catch up with you guys. Are you both coming? We will both be there. Yes, we're going to be doing a live recording at the show on the Friday before the show. And then we'll be walking the show on Saturday. So we'll definitely stop by the booth, have some product, catch up with you. Hopefully you're there when we walk by, but if not, we'll we'll come by again, but we'd love to meet you in person. Absolutely. We'd love to meet you guys in person too. And we're releasing our new flavor at the show. So I'll have a case for you guys. And yeah, awesome. we look forward to finally meeting you in person. Absolutely. Us too. Us Thanks too. so much. I really appreciate it. Like I said, love the, the branding and the product and Great story. And, and you as an entrepreneur just seem like you're you're doing all the right things. So really excited to see where you take the brand. Hey, thanks, guys. I really appreciate this opportunity. It means a lot. And thank you for your time and having me. It's an honor. Thanks so much, Mitch. Have a good night. Yeah, hey, you too, guys. Thank you. See take care. That was a great chat. Not a lot of our, our guests have been out of Calgary. So it was cool to, cool to have a, a, a Calgarian on the cast and and I think what Revita is doing is a really cool white space and I, I like how they're approaching it and I really like I really like Mitch and, and Carly and Rob's story. Justin, what were some of your takeaways? Yeah, I, I loved his story as well. Uh really cool product, great guy, uh super humble, kind, thankful throughout. My biggest takeaway, he said something at the beginning, but then he came back to it at the end with his advice, um, which was he started talking about the golden handcuffs. And how getting further along in his career, it becomes harder and harder to start something new and go out on your own. And then he sort of went back to it at the end with the, the start today or using the someday excuse. I think that is important because I, I do think as you get further along in your career, hopefully, if things are going well, you make more and more money. Then the challenge to actually go back and start something from scratch becomes harder and harder and harder. 
it's one of the reasons that I chose to go back to school after working for a year was my dad gave me that advice when I was younger. Like the, the longer you put off getting this education, the harder it's going to be for you to give up the income. So try and do it as, as young as you can. And I think it's the same with, with some of these founders. So just advice that if you, if you, there's something you really want to do and you have a dream to launch something, just go for it. What about you? I, I love all of that and agree. I think I think his way of delivering that message was super clear. And I think like one of the things I thought Mitch does really well is he just kind of simplifies a lot mm-hmm. of what aren't really necessarily complex things, but we often over complexify them. Uh, you know, his lay one brick at a time kind of mentality. And, and um, I think he has a, a bit of humor and humility as well as he as he's approached this, I think that recipe is really powerful. And I've said this before on, on, on the pod, like I think simplicity is one of the biggest strengths you can have in terms of, um, you know, putting together an approach that is able to be used every day. Right. And I think, I think Mitch had some really cool insights and, 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 and seems to live that. So that was, I think, one of my big ones from from chatting with Mitch. Yeah, great guy. I, I wish him a ton of success. Anytime you're entering the U.S. market, it's great if you're already listed at Walmart Canada. Hopefully, that's a that's a great help for him, and and hopefully, he takes the the U.S. by storm. If you haven't already, make sure to like, subscribe, follow us on social media, give us five star reviews. And head out to a Walmart near you or an independent near you or a a Safeway or a Sobeys and get your hands on some of Mitch's Revita product. Thanks everyone for listening. We'll chat soon.